Well, this morning, if you're visiting with us today, we are concluding a series, as Wayne said, we're concluding a series entitled, We Are. And who are we as Rock Creek Church of God? What, is, what does that really mean in the life of our church, in the life of our families, in, the, in our personal lives? You know, what does it mean that we are Rock Creek Church of God? And we've been looking at the way in which we feel God has called us to interact as, as believers, to interact with others. And, and we've First week we looked at that we're called to connect, that we're called to connect to God and to others, and that this is a call upon our lives. We've, we've been looking at Matthew chapter 28, this great commission that Jesus gave to his disciples. Last week we looked at this whole idea that, that we're called to grow, that, that there's something about growing in our faith that, that we're supposed to not just learn and simply retain and be able to recite information, but we're actually supposed to do something with it. I know it's a crazy, groundbreaking thought, but that God didn't just want us to, to gather information. He wanted us to apply the information that we've learned with and thus grow in our faith. And then today we're going to be looking at that we're called to go and share the gospel. You know, that, that we're all in some sense, in some way, called to be a missionary. In fact, turn to your neighbor and say, hey, you're, you're supposed to be a missionary. And some of you are thinking, no, you, you misheard from God, right? But, but I, want to, I want to really kind of look at what that means because I think that there's a truth to that. You know, and, and although we have a, a different ways in which we view missionaries, you know, I've sat in this congregation when I was little. I loved Missionary Sunday when we would have missionaries come and visit. Do you remember those days? And they would have this little Rolodex of pictures and it would be like, and then they would show something then. You know, they would show something else, and, and then they had this little display of, of all the, the things from their country, and we got to go and, and see it and try things on and look at it and then don't touch, you know, and like all of these type of things as a kid. I loved Missionary Sunday, but, but what does that look like as a believer? What does it look like if we just don't feel like we're called to, to go overseas? You know, what does it look like to go as a believer when we hear the words of Jesus calling his disciples to go? What does that look like in our everyday life? What does that look like if we have no intention of getting our passport? What does that look like as a believer in Jesus Christ? Well, if you missed any of this series, uh, you can find those online. You can also find those in our app if you search for Rock Creek Church of God. And the sermon notes and all of those things are there. If you want to get caught up uh, this week, you're welcome to do so. But the first week we learned this, that the church was born to become a community where people can belong and not an event for people to attend. In fact, as you read the book of Acts, as you read the birth of the church in the New Testament, that, that it wasn't an event that you attended. We, we don't see that in, in the New Testament church. What we see is that to be a part of the church meant that you were a part of a community. In fact, it, it was a denying of everything else, and you come into a community with people, and it you gathered together in homes, and you gathered together in the temple courts, and we broke bread to get with one another and taught one another. And, and this was just a community to belong to. This wasn't an event that you attended. You know, nowadays we, we go to church. You know, we, we come to church. We bring people to church. You know, but, but in the early days, they, that would have not made sense to them. We are the church. You know, it's just who we are. And we gather together to worship, but, but, but we're always the church. And you know, we can't leave church. You, know, you, you are the church. And so we, we wrestled around what it does it really mean to connect with God and to others. Last week we realized that a growing relationship with God and others is intentional. And in fact, this, even though it's a great spiritual principle, this applies to anything. If you're going to grow in a relationship, it has to be intentional. I've never heard someone describe their marriage and say, you know, we, we just kind of drifted closer together. No, you're, typically you drift apart. That's what happens if, unless you're intentional about that relationship. You know, the same thing is true with our relationship with God. I've never heard someone say, you know, I just kind of, you know, 20 years, I just kind of drifted off and I found myself closer to God. No, it's an intentional walk. It's an intentional decision to grow in our faith, to read God's word, to apply God's word, to, to, to look after the things in which God has called us to be and to realize that he's given us the power and the strength and the spirit to do it, to grow, not just simply retain information, but this intentional act of growing with God and with others. So what does it mean that we're called to go? What does that look like in our life? What does that look like in the life of Rock Creek Church of God? You know, as I was thinking about that question, this question always comes to my mind because I've seen this displayed 
And I think it's true no matter what setting you're in. I want to ask you this question. This is something only you can answer. If you had the opportunity to change someone's future for the better, would you do it? If you had the opportunity to change someone's future for the better, would you do it? How about this? If you had the opportunity not just to change someone's future, but to actually change their family tree for the better, would you take that opportunity? We typically don't look at things in that manner. I mean, I'm sure all of us would say, well, well yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to choose no. You know, I'm not, not a terrible person. I mean, yes, if I had the opportunity to make someone's life better or to, to change someone's family tree for the better, of course I would, I would do that. But I mean, that's not on my calendar. You know, it's not like Monday, change someone's life for the better. Tuesday, we got to go to the grocery store. You know, it's not something we typically put on our calendars. But, but the reality is, is that, that as we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, as we share that relationship with others as we lead other people to the Lord through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's amazing what God has done in people's life. I mean, think back in your life. And maybe you're very blessed. Maybe you're like me. You had this lineage of faith, this heritage of faith that, that, you know, mom and dad loved the Lord and grandma and grandpa loved the Lord and great grandma and grandpa loved the Lord. And, and there's this heritage of faith. But I would be willing to bet even within this community that that, that is not everyone's story. In fact, your story may be, oh, this, is, this just started with me. <laughs> or, you know, my mom was the first one to really kind of grab onto Christ, and she was the one who told me about a relationship with Jesus. Or, or you know, it, it, it was just, I was, I was a teenager, I got involved in youth group, and, and no one else in my family was, was really religious, or they, they cared anything about church, or they ever spoke about Christ, but, but there was just something about this community, and something about this relationship with Jesus Christ. It was there that I heard about my, my sin, I had forgiveness of my sins through his death, the resurrection, what he had done upon the cross, and, and maybe you came to a relationship with Jesus. But as you look back on that lineage of faith, that, that there was this moment where someone made a decision for Jesus Christ, and it, and it affects everything forward. In fact, this doesn't just happen positively. This also happens negatively. When we have negative things within our family background, and it just seems to repeat itself over and over again. If you had the opportunity to change someone's future or their family tree for the better, would you do it? Well, the scripture we're going to look at today, we have this believer in Jesus Christ who does just that. We have this this one who who determines to do what God is calling them to do, even though they're not quite sure of the plan, even though they're not quite sure of the agenda here, but they're just simply following the direction of God. And as they follow the direction of God, they don't realize it at the time because we never realize this. right? You never have this conversation with someone and go leaving going, I just changed their family tree. No, I mean, that never happens, right? I mean, we, we never know the rest of the story. We're not Paul Harvey, right? We don't get to hear the rest of the story typically. We, we just have to, you know, see it as years pass and we look back and we rise in that moment. Something amazing was taking place. I mean, we thought it was great, but we just didn't realize the magnitude of it. You know, I, I look back in people's lives and those in which we've ministered to and, and a lot of people that I've just had the opportunity just to be on the sidelines cheering what's taking place. And I've seen God change family trees. I've seen him take families that had grown up and, and young people who had grown up with, with an, an addiction and young people who had grown up with abuse and young people who had grown up with, with separation and all of these things. And all of a sudden now as I look at their families, they've gotten married and they have kids and both their husband and wife are loving the Lord and their kid is never going to know a home with that in it. Their kid's never going to know a home that doesn't know Christ. Their kid, I mean, they've changed the family tree from that point forward. It's amazing the power of that. We don't see it in the moment. But it's a very powerful thing. In fact, it's what we're going to see today as we read through Matthew 28, verses 19 and through 20. Our verse that we've kind of stood on these last three weeks. Jesus said this to his disciples, verse 19, Therefore go... And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What we find is that for each and every one of us, if you, if you call yourself a believer in Jesus Christ, that going requires personal obedience. 
It's not a collaborative thing. It's not, you know, but that it really is a personal call. You know, this, this, this command of God, but really it is this calling that he's placed on our lives. And I think there's a, there's a huge distinction that, between that. that sometimes the, uh, a demand from God can feel like an obligation, but, but when we see this, this calling that God has placed on our lives to go into all the world and to make disciples, all of a sudden it brings purpose into why we're here. All of a sudden it brings purpose into our lives, and we realize that God has placed us here for a very powerful reason, and that's to go. What does that look like? And it's so hard to break out of sometimes the things, the imagery in which we have when we, when we think of being a missionary for Christ, when we think of you know, doing something great for God. We, we, I mean, none of us ever feel qualified to do great things for God, right? I've never gathered in a room and said, okay, who feels qualified? And God's going to have lucky to have me to be on his team, right? God's going to just you know, get excited because I've volunteered. No, none of us feel like we're called to go, like we're able to go. But yet it's a personal obedience that we find. Eleanor Roosevelt said this, One's philosophy is not best expressed in words. It is expressed in the choices one makes, and the choices we make are ultimately our responsibility. So today we gather one who made a personal decision to not only hear God's call, but to obey it. And we find it in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. I love this story in Scripture. I love it because what we find is that, that Philip's story, you know, Philip, we, he comes on the scene just a, a couple of chapters before, and, and in the, the new church that had been established, this, this community of people, what was taking place is that they had widows, and they were trying to, to distribute the food, and, and not everybody was getting what their, their proper share of food, and, and the disciples were busy kind of trying to figure all of this out, and, and finally they stopped, and they said, you know what? This isn't right for us to be doing. You know, we need to focus on prayer and the, the you know, proclamation of God's word. So, so pick out seven men who are, are faithful and who are, are godly and let them distribute the food. And so, so Philip becomes a part of these first seven who are the first deacons within the church. That his call is to, to simply kind of wait tables. That his call is to make sure that all of the widows and, and those in his care gets their proper allotment of food. And we see Philip's call in this moment. And it could have been very easy for Philip to say, well, you know, this is what God's called me to do. I'm called to wait tables. I'm called to make sure that the widows, that's a proper calling, right? That's a great calling. And although Philip was, was happy with that calling, he was satisfied with that calling, he, he understood that, that God doesn't just call us to do one thing, that we're always to be on mission for him. And oftentimes what can happen if we're not careful in church world is that we get so focused on what we feel like is our responsibility that we forget that God has also called us to simply be a Christian, to be open to his calling upon our lives. And when that he calls us, that we're to obey. And so we pick up with Philip in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. And we see in verse 26, it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. And on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Kandeki, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. You see, Philip has had a quality about his life as we read Scripture. What we find is that the quality was very simple. I don't know if Philip was a simple man, but I know that the way in which he lived his life. I mean, if you look at it from an outsider's perspective, it was very simple philosophy. And here's what it was. I listen to God, and then I obey what he tells me to do. I listen to God, and then I obey what he tells me to do. I don't get mixed up in the, the agenda. I don't, I don't really care about all of the details. But as God calls me to do something, I'm just going to do it. And then I'm going to trust that when I get to that point, God's going to tell me what I need to do again. This was Philip's life. If you read through the life of Philip, it's what he does. He listens and obeys. Listens and obeys. I don't know if you have a life philosophy. If you don't, could I encourage you to adopt Philip's? To listen to the call of God on your life and simply obey 
what he's calling you to do. And as we look at Philip's life, I mean, in this moment, as an angel of the Lord says to him, go south to the road, the desert road, what we find is that one thing can stop personal obedience. As, as God is placing a personal call upon our life, there's one thing that can definitely stop it, and ex excuses. Have you ever given excuses to God? <laughs> Just me? Okay. But, but, you know, as we, we wrestle with this relationship with God, as we wrestle with the, the call of God on our life, I mean, it's so easy for us to come up with excuses, right? I mean, especially Philip in this moment. If I'm Philip in this moment, I mean, you know, we could say, well, I mean, if an angel told me to do something, I would do it. But the Word of God tells us to do something, and we casually take it as just a suggestion. So, so I'm just going to push back on that a little bit, right? And as, as, a, as a believer of Christ, has God ever called you to do something, and you just begin to make up excuses? When I put myself in Philip's shoes, I just think, I would have been filled with a lot of questions. I mean, God, could you be a little bit more clear? God, I'm willing to obey. I mean, I definitely, and that sounds great. Go south, desert road, you know, that that's all sounds really good. But how far am I supposed to go until I'm supposed to stop? God, what's the agenda? If you could just, I mean, a typed agenda, if you could just email it to me, right? I mean, that would be great. I mean, I just want to get it on my calendar. And, and Lord, as I look at my week, this week really is kind of booked. So maybe next week go south, right? So, so maybe next week we could be a better time for whatever it is that you're planning. God, I'm sure it's great. But whatever it is that you're planning, maybe next week would be better for all of us that's involved. Yeah, probably even works better for you. And then Philip doesn't do this, does he? And in fact, as you look at, the reality, verse 26, it says that, that as the angel tells him to do this, verse 27, so he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury. As he starts down this path, he sees this great caravan, what would, would have been a great caravan of people. And he sees this individual on a chariot, which means he had to have been important. And as he's watching all of this going down, he doesn't know, you know, the angel didn't say, go south, you'll see a chariot. You know, no, none of that. Just go south. And as he goes to go south, he begins to, to witness all of these things that's taking place. It says this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. And the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Now, I don't know about you, but I hate awkward situations. Do you, any of you with me in this moment? Like, like some people like it, I pray for you, because that's not right. You know, but, but most of us, if we're willing to be honest, most of us kind of, we, we don't like awkward situations. In fact, for me, here's what I, I just, I'm a nervous talker, any nervous talkers, right? I'll start making up conversation with people I have no business making up conversation with, and the only reason I'm making it up is because I am kind of feel awkward. And, and th you know, this past weekend, we were celebrating Bella's birthday, we were in the hotel, we were doing the whole pool thing, and, and I'm, I'm in the elevator, which is the most awkward room, I don't know, like, if there's a more awkward room, Room than the elevator. Why? Because you get on with people you, have, you don't know, and, and as they step on, you have to say something, right? Because you can't be the weirdo who just sits silently looking at buttons. And so, so I just start talking, and I, I always, it doesn't without fail, I start asking too many questions for elevator chatter, right? I mean, it's supposed to stick to a couple things, you know, the weather, you know, the stay in the hotel, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the atmosphere, whatever. But, but, you know, don't start asking questions about their kids, their family. It's just weird, right? And so, but that's me. That's what I start doing. So, hey, hey, who are you here with? And like, you got kids? And like, what are you, what are you doing, right? We're, we're just going to floor seven. Okay, calm down, buddy. And, but that's what happens is I get nervous and I start talking. And, and as I look at Philip in this situation, I just think there's no way. I mean, I would just say, God, this is going to be awkward. I don't know these people. I definitely don't know the man on the chariot. And to go and stand near, like I have, like, who walks up to a group of people and just starts walking beside them? Weird people. That's who. Like, like, that's what happens. And, but yet that's what Philip is supposed to do. That's what God has called him to do. Just go to the chariot and stand by it. Don't say anything yet. Just stand by it. So what's Philip's response? He goes. We begin to realize that going requires journeying with others. That when God places a call in our life to go, that He's not going to place it for us to go by ourselves. He's going to call for us to go, and He's going to connect us with others. 
And it may be intimidating, and it may be awkward in the moment. But here's what Philip does, verse 30. Then Philip ran to the chariot. (laughs) Philip, don't make the situation weirder, right? Like, just walk casually as though you're on the same destination. You know, just stroll to the chariot, Philip. Ease your roll. No, no, no. Philip begins to run to the chariot. In in a culture that running typically doesn't take place unless something's happening terribly wrong, right? Philip runs to the chariot. And he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. And he asked him the question, Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Wow. I mean, here, this very awkward moment. Here, this moment that Philip doesn't know what's about to take place. All Philip knows is I'm supposed to go south. Philip goes south. All Philip knows is they told me to go stand by the chariot. I'm going to run and stand by the chariot. All Philip knows is that as he hears the word of God being spoken, all of a sudden he begins to get an idea about what God is up to. Here's the second thing that can stop our journeying with others, and it's, and it's this, emotions. Our emotions can really hinder at times what God is trying to do within our life. And it's not that emotions are bad. In fact, emotions can be a very great, great thing. But at times we can allow them to hinder what God is doing. What I mean by this is that, that as, as Philip goes up and he comes to the chariot, it would have been so easy to be so overjoyed with emotion. Why? Because he's been listening to God and he's been following God and as he's listening and following down the road and then he listens and follows and he goes to the chariot, he hears the word of God being spoken and Philip knew exactly what he was reading. Right? Philip understood exactly what, what the prophet Isaiah was, what book was being spoken about. He knew exactly what the eunuch was reading while he was in the chariot. And it would have been so easy to just jump into conversation midstream. Hey, 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 I know that book, right? I know exactly what's taking place. In fact, did you know what Isaiah is talking about? It's about Jesus and Jesus came, he died, he rose again. I'm saved, set free, hallelujah, glory, glory. I mean, our emotions get so to the most of us that, that oftentimes we don't slow down enough. To do what Philip did. To just ask a question. Do you know what you're reading? Do you know how powerful questions are in the lives of people? To not just assume that they know, to not assume that they don't know, but to simply ask the question, hey, do you know what you're reading? And all of a sudden that door opens up. And for Philip, the door was simply this. No, I I really don't. Would you come up into the chariot and tell me? It's so amazing to me how as believers, if we'll just begin to ask questions, it's amazing the doors that begin to open naturally. We can just calm down enough with our emotions to just see where people are at. You know, the truth is, oftentimes, we don't take time to know where people really are coming from. We don't take time to know the history. We don't take time to know their current situation. We just jump in an assumption that we know, and we don't know. In fact, someone once told me, you know, people are fighting battles that you know nothing about, so don't assume that you know. And the only way that you know is to ask questions. Do you know what you're reading? To see where people are. Philip does this in an amazing way. How how does Philip grab this? I mean, how does the Spirit use Philip in this manner? Well, I mean, think about the life in which Jesus lived. Think about the questions that Jesus would ask others. Who touched me? Well, come on, Jesus, you know who touched you. You're the Son of God. No, 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 Who, who touched me? Do you want to get well? Jesus, of course, we're sick. We want to get better. No, no, no. Do you want to get well? Questions have a powerful way of revealing where people truly are. But one thing can stop them, and it's emotions. Why? Because oftentimes we get so excited, we just, we just jump in instead of first asking. And excitement is great. We, we need more excitement. But sometimes we just need to realize that where a person's at is very important to know before we just start spouting off 
the answers that we think they need. Sometimes we can get bitter. Have you ever gotten bitter or mad at somebody? Again, I'm sure that's just me. But we can, we can get, take offense that people don't immediately invite us up into the chariot. We can take offense that they don't immediately open up and say, well, well hey, what, what is it? You know, would you help explain this to me? And, we, and if we're not careful, our emotions begin to dictate and they can stop us from truly journeying with others. Well, what we find is that as Paul climbs up into the chariot, he begins to grow in this relationship with one another and this grow in this relationship with Jesus Christ. And here's what takes place, verse 32. This is the passage of Scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? You see, this ability for Philip to just stop in this moment, to obey God in this moment, and to ask the question, do you know what you're reading? Allowed him the invitation to step up into the chariot. And as the, Philip, as the eunuch read through this passage of Scripture, it led to the eunuch asking Philip, tell me, please, what does this mean? I mean, how open does the door have to get? Tell me, if you can shed any light on this scripture for me, it would be much appreciated. Would you please tell me? Is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? In verse 35, then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and he told him the good news about Jesus. He began with exactly where the man was. He met him exactly where he was in that chariot, exactly where he was spiritually with his understanding of God's word. And he took that moment and he began to help him paint this fuller picture of who Christ Jesus was, what he had came to do. And he helped him understand about this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It says in verse 35, then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Verse 36, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? I mean, this was a great day. <laughs> this, this was like a happy day. This is a church day where both hands should be in the air, right? This was a big moment in the life of the church. In fact, this moment, Scripture says, all of heaven was rejoicing. Why? Because all of heaven rejoices when one sinner gets saved and his eunuch realized that he was a sinner, that he had hope that Jesus Christ had came, that he had paid the sacrifice for his sins, and that as he accepts that sacrifice, that he's now forgiven. He's been made new. And then as he shared with him the gospel, he shared with him how, how that first step in obedience is to walk in Christian baptism, to, to make this declaration of what God has done on the outside, what he's done on the inside. And as they're pulling up along some water, the man says, look, there's some water. I mean, should I get baptized? Well, what can stop me from getting baptized, right? We don't wait to have to wait till Sunday. We don't have to wait till we get a larger, like we got people here, let's just do this right now. Let's go. Verse 38, and he gave the orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Now I said Philip had the opportunity to change someone's future, but he also had the opportunity to change someone's family tree. In fact, if you study this passage and if you study church history, the church of God, the, the church in Ethiopia, the, the church that believes the disciples of Jesus Christ, they trace their spiritual heritage back to this moment in history. They trace their spiritual heritage as a country back to this moment where this Ethiopian eunuch on his way back from Jerusalem was met a disciple on the, the South Gaza Road and that as the disciple explained the good news of Jesus Christ that this man came into a relationship with Jesus and it not just changed his life. A whole country says that's where our faith came from. As this man came back and as he shared the good news of Jesus Christ that it was, it was started in that moment. I mean, I guarantee you, Philip didn't think, wake up and think, you know what, today I'm going to set the course of history for you know, Ethiopia. No, 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 <laughs> we don't think in those terms. But what he did do was this. He got up and said, you know what, God, where you call me to go, I'm going to go. What you call me to do, I'm going to do. 
And I'm going to leave the results. I'm going to leave the future. I'm going to leave all of that in your hands because I know you care about your church far more than I ever could. And I know you've got a plan greater than I could ever imagine. But God, in this moment, you've called me to go. And I'm going to be obedient. Verse 39, many people have asked me to explain, explain the scripture. I, I don't know quite sure how to explain it except God moved. Verse 39, when they, when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Now that would be strange, huh? Right? I mean, I got baptized right here when I was eight years old. Pat was there. Philip was there. You guys got baptized at the same time, right? But, but I was standing in this baptistry, but what didn't happen was that when I came up, my dad didn't disappear, right? I mean, that would have been strange, right? I mean, for any one of us, that's a unique moment. That doesn't happen often. But yet for this Ethiopian eunuch, the scripture says that when he came up out of the water, that, that the Spirit of the Lord took Philip away. He was gone. So what happens to the Ethiopian eunuch? He flipped out. He gave up on Christ. He ran. I mean, no, no, that doesn't what it says at all, right? In fact, here's what it says. It says that he went on his way rejoicing. How does that take place? How does one come to a relationship with Jesus Christ and the very one who's been revealing the scripture of God to you, the very one who's been opening up your eyes spiritually to all of these things, the very one who got down off of the chariot, went down into the water, baptized you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, how can it be that that person disappears and your faith isn't shattered? It's because Philip didn't let it rest upon himself. He pointed all direction to Jesus Christ. And although Philip was gone, Jesus was still there. You see, there's one thing that can stop our growing with others, and it's a difficulty that we can have, all of us, if we're not careful with, and that's ego. If we're not careful, our ego can interrupt the things that God is doing. You see, it's been, been very easy for Philip's ego to begin to increase in this moment. Here's a young man that he was very high in his official stance. He, he was riding on the chariot. No one else was on the chariot. And he got to go up into the chariot. And then not only that, he got to explain to this very important individual all what the scripture meant. And he got to lead them in this great spiritual encounter, so much so that the man gets off of his chariot, goes down and gets baptized. I mean, it, that has a possibility of increasing your ego a little bit. Why? Because you've got the answers. And let's be honest, we like it when we have the answers. But I'm reminded of the words of John in John chapter 3, verse 30. He must become greater I must become less. That there's this humility of spirit as a believer that realizes that it's not about us, but it is about Jesus Christ. And that if we point other people towards us like we have the answer, we're going to let them down drastically. Why? Because we may have this answer in this moment, but I guarantee you there's a question coming that we do not have the answer to. That only Christ does. And I think what can happen is that when we begin to get people to focus on us as a pastor, when we get people to focus on us as a Sunday school leader, or when we just get people to focus on us as the one who's led them to Jesus Christ, as though we're the ones who have the answer, we're just setting them up for failure. Because there's only one who has the answers, and that's Christ. There's only one, and Philip understood that we have to push the attention towards, and that's the pushing the attention towards Jesus Christ. Church, we can even get in danger of, of letting people think that Rock Creek Church of God has the answer. Lord, we have nothing without Jesus Christ. It's the one name that we need to lift up. It's the one name that can truly change family trees. It's the one name that can break addiction. It's the one name that can restore marriages. It's the one name that can bring about life and life abundantly. One name and one name alone, and that's Jesus. And that's why we got to push the name of Jesus. It's why we got to make sure that that begins and ends our conversation. It's why we got to make sure that when we're leading people into relationship and we're connecting with them and growing with them, when we're calling them to go, that they have to realize that the name above all names is Jesus Christ. And of course, we look honorably to those who've led us in those conversations. We're thankful for those who take the time to invest in us, but as a believer in Jesus Christ, we always have to make sure that our ego doesn't get out of control and that we don't let the attention turn upon us, but that we always keep it where it needs to be, and that's on Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Three things can stop the go in your Christian life. 
your excuses, your emotions, and your ego. If you don't believe me, I, I like these words my friend Casey Carricker once said. He says, as a Christ follower, the question is not if I am a missionary nor when I am a missionary, but where I live on mission. That if we're a believer here today, that God's called us to go. And I don't know where he's called you to go. For Philip, he called him to go south down the desert road. For you, he may call you to go across the, to the next cubicle. Or maybe just across the room to your spouse. I want you to actually knock on your child's door and to begin to involve in this awkward, this kind of strange conversation about faith. Maybe it's to walk across the street, as we talked about last series, to our neighbor and just, just begin to ask questions and really see where they are instead of assuming that we know what's going on in that house. I don't know where he's called you to go, but I do believe that he's called us to go. And that if we'll take the life theme of Philip, if we'll just begin to listen and obey, I promise that he won't lead us to places that he will not equip us for. That he'll do great and mighty things and that, that we will be a part of changing lives for the better, that we will be a part of changing family trees, not because of who we are, but because of who Christ is and what he's came to do. I would love to hear the stories of how Christ has changed your life. I would love to hear the stories of how Christ has changed your family tree. And as much as I would love to hear all of those stories, what it makes me amazed is that God has more stories of those to write. And he wants to use you to do it. He wants you to begin to be that author, the, the one that says, you know what, I, just, I never thought this was my call in life. I just thought I was supposed to show up and serve coffee. I just thought I was supposed to show up and sing. I just thought I was supposed to show up and, and be nice to people. But, but God has called me to this very specific area, and I just feel like if I go, he's opening these doors of opportunity, and you never know what God's going to do with that. Now, some of that may happen in this building, in this sanctuary, and I'm so thankful for that. But here's what's amazing. For Philip, it happened on a desert road. For you, it may happen in an office cubicle or in a home. But God is going to do great, mighty things if we'll listen and obey. If we'll trust that he is up to great and mighty things, that his plan is greater than our plan. And if we'll just simply be obedient to what he's called us to do. We'll not throw up excuses every time he's asking us to do something. Why? Because it feels awkward or it just doesn't feel like us. No, no. Do like Philip. Just run to the situation. Trust that God's going to open the door. Trust that when we get there, just, just learn to begin to, to let God just kind of be your presence and learn to ask questions before we jump in and assume that we know everything. And as you ask questions, I guarantee you doors will begin to open. But as they open, do not let your ego think that you opened them. So easy to do. So easy to think, man, I'm, I'm, I'm just a, man, I'm a great talker. I talk, people listen. Man, I just, I'm able to break it down so easily. I, people, I just can break it down, they understand it. No, no, we can do nothing apart from Christ. Man, when I sing, it just like people just come to tears. We make sing and make goosebumps happen, but God can change a heart. That's something a song never does. Only the Spirit of God. Never confuse what's taking place as though it's us. But always realize that God can use us to do great and mighty things if we'll simply step to the side and allow Him to work. Don't allow your ego to get in the way of your going. Church, I'm excited because as I look at this sanctuary and as I look at the people that are filling it today, I know God has used men and women to do just what Philip has done, to change lives and to change family trees for the better. God's not done. He desires to use you. Why don't you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, God, we ask that as we gather today, Lord, for those that are believers in this room, God, that you would call them to go. Lord, I don't, pretend to know where that's going to be. I don't pretend to know exactly what's going to take place, but God, what I do know is that if we'll trust you and obey you, 
will be amazed at where our journey takes us. So God, we pray that you would use us to impact the lives of others. God, that we would not be those who simply listen and, and listen and listen and never go. But God, that we would be those believers who are growing actively in our faith and looking for opportunities to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Asking questions to truly see people where they are instead of assuming that we know. God, I pray that you would call individually us this morning. Set people on our hearts, God. Begin to work in our lives and do great and mighty things. Lord, I pray for those that don't know you here today to realize that they start a new chapter this morning. It's their decision. Lord, just as the Ethiopian eunuch, he didn't wake up that day thinking, you know what, today is going to be the change for me. Today it's going to happen. But, but he found himself in that moment and he had a decision to make. Do I receive it or do I reject it? And Lord God, he received it and he was baptized that day and he went on his way rejoicing and it changed not just his life, not just his family's life, but the life of a country. God, I pray that today, for those who don't know you here this morning, that they're realizing, God, that you're asking them to believe in you. God, you're asking them to realize that you've paid the ultimate sacrifice for their sins. And Lord, no matter what their history is, you can write a new future for them in this moment. If they'll accept you, receive you, and believe. That's such a powerful moment. Let us not simply walk by it. But Lord, if you're speaking to people and you're speaking to their hearts today, God, I pray that you would impress upon them just as you impressed upon the Ethiopian. Don't let this moment pass. Respond immediately to what God is telling you to do. Lord, we thank you for loving us this much, for caring about each and every one of us as individuals, for not giving up on us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church, I want to invite you to stand this morning and these altars are open. If you'd like to come, and as the Ethiopian eunuch, if you'd like to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to come. Today can be the start of something different for you. Maybe God is calling you to go, and maybe like me, it's, it's, it's scary and you feel awkward. Maybe you want to call, come and just say, God, I just need, need the boldness to go and to obey. God, God, keep me from, from being me. God, just keep me from, from saying things just above. Lord, help me to learn to ask questions. God, help my ego not to get in the way. Maybe it's just that we come and we say, God, prepare us for what you desire for us to do. Wherever you're at this morning, I want you to know that these altars are open. That God loves you more than you could ever know. And he's got a plan for you and for me. Let's sing.